but I don't like to admit that. This meeting is being recorded. All right, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our end of April TA Leaders Forum meeting. A uh, good group of uh, faces, smiles. It's maybe more, are there more smirks than smiles? So uh, just to review the agenda, we're just going to do a little uh, welcome celebrations. If you guys have anything, I think most of you are probably celebrating uh, three weeks to go or four weeks to go before the end of the school year. So uh, Shannon says the 90 days of May have almost begun. So we'll be getting uh, that going. Talk a little bit more about MAP21. I think more and more that people are training um, will maybe have some more aha moments or questions to talk about. Let Stephanie talk about her uh, webinar that she's doing on Tuesday next week. Uh, there was an uh, update on the um, SB1630. If anybody's been following that, we'll get an update on that. And then a question posed about field trips, just how they're assigned and what your process is. Uh, and then just end of the year processes as we close down the year. So should take us uh, just past an hour. So with that, um, Tommy is, I'd like to, you know, we haven't, we haven't seen Tommy. So welcome to uh, our meeting and a couple other um, faces that maybe started with us in 2020 during our initial starts of these meetings with COVID and whatnot. So Darla, I see, and uh, David Jacobson's back, hasn't been in a couple of these for a little bit. So welcome if I missed you. Um, I, I'm sure some others will trickle in. But with that, anybody got any celebrations uh, that they want to share? Maybe just for to kick off the meeting on a positive note. Brian? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we completed our first cohort um, for CDLs. We got six uh, district employees that were in other departments, their CDLs and DPS certifications. And we've started our second now that we've got um, classes that we're going through. Um, it's been phenomenal helping out when other drivers are gone. Our mechanics are driving much less frequently and uh, um, kids are getting a lot better service. <laughs> so it's, it's, been, it's been really great. Very good. Good to hear. Any other celebrations? Uh, is uh, David? Do you have a celebration? Are you calling me out, Jason? <laughs> well, I think that's a celebration, is it not? <laughs> well, I don't know yet. Uh, the fourteen, fifteen-hour days haven't stopped. I don't suspect. Uh, it. Well, that, that won't. That they didn't. Uh, they didn't share that with you. That that doesn't change. I was doing it before, but now it's just a different. Uh, the only good thing is a, a different pay grade. But I am. Sure. Scott's still now. There you go. Welcome. Congratulations, yes. sir. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Accident free miles. I'm approaching 400,000 accident free miles. There you go, Shannon. Those are good. Yeah. Are good. Way to go. I'll take one more celebration and we'll move into um, number two. Nobody? Okay. Well. I'm happy to see everybody's uh, everybody back in here and that honestly that these are continuing to be um, valuable hopefully to the group and um, you know I always look forward to to just talking talking shop with you all so I'm happy to see see my friends and acquaintances yeah uh, so let's get right into map 21 ELDT stuff anybody um, successfully got through the first portion of training and pushing their you know new new drivers or new staff through the eldt process anybody want to share what that looks like we oh. got our first one in um and i'm not completely sure about the process uh typically we put people in in class regardless of whether they have their permit or not uh and i'm curious if anybody has started a class and completed a class with someone who does not have their permit yet and was able to enter that information. Um, we, I um, just, go ahead. We just finished, excuse me, finished our first from beginning to end person. And while it was successful, I will tell you that I was, we were a little bit surprised 
realized that like there's a there's very much a time sensitivity that's different than it used to be as it relates to just okay now we have everything and we'll submit it right it's put this in before you put this in and you can't put this in until that's been like for instance the range or the road to, or the road uh the miles behind the um sorry the behind the wheel miles um has to be there for so many hours or days before you can input the next phase of the training that you completed. And then it can't go to third party until that's been in there for so long and and so forth. So the time sensitivity of the process um, was a surprise for us, but we, we got it done. And so now I feel like we have some, some detailed, you know, notes and aha moments that'll make it easier. Yeah, I like I said, I'm curious to see if they will accept somebody's classroom, so their theory, before they have their permit in hand. Because you, yeah. you're supposed to put it in 48 hours after class. And yeah, if they it doesn't. accept it before they have a permit, how do you do that? Stephanie, you want to chime in? I see you shaking her head. You don't have to do it one at a time. You can do it all at once at the end. What they care, what the time sensitivity is... Um, can be eliminated if you just put nothing in until you're completely done. You don't have to, there's no rule that says you have to do it one at a time. You well, can, I'm just saying like the dates, you, when, you, when it asks you the dates that you completed each piece, if they're not right, uh, sequential as it... Yeah, that's what I'm saying, Shannon. You don't, when, what they want to know is when you're completely done with training. So you can look at that as an individual theory, classroom, whatever, or you can just take a 30,000 foot view and say, we are not completely done with, with uh, training uh, Bob until Bob is done with everything. And then you just go in and put everything in all at once. The theory, the class B, the whatever it is that you taught. You can do that all at once at the end. There's, there's no rule that you have to do it ongoing as you teach things. Right, we, and we did put it in at all at once. It's just the dates of each item completion. Um, anyway, we had a little bit of a lull between our classroom and finishing the behind the wheel and it was, it was getting grumpy with us. So we put them in at the same time, but the dates of each section completion challenged us a little bit. And, okay, and I hear that. And what I'm saying is you don't have to use those individual dates. So if you, oh. com if you completed theory on, on February 1st, but you didn't complete behind the wheel until February 15th, you don't have to use the February 1st date. You can use, they're asking for completion over, over all of the training. So you don't, you don't need to mess with dates. Just use one date. For all huh. for everything that you're completed with, it is going to be picky though that it has to be within that 48 hour time frame. So what I'm telling people is, don't put any don't submit stuff until you're completely done and you know they're ready to test, and then you just put it in all at once, and that date should be you know within two days of the date that you're inputting the information. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. I'll try so it. I thought that I thought that the theory had to be um, submitted within 24, 48 hours. So I haven't gotten as far as the behind the wheel with anybody yet, but we have entered the theory. Yeah, and you okay. Can, you can do it that way, but if you if you're finding that it's glitchy, you can do it all at once. There's no rule, Darla, about one at a time having to be done in a certain time period. The regulation is that you must uh, input all of the trainees data within 48 hours of when you're complete. That complete does not have a definition of one topic at a time. Got so, it. Okay. No thank, you for, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, and there's no rule about what you do first. So Patrick, you said something about doing theory first or I, I'm not sure uh, where you were going with that, but you can start your training before a trainee has anything. They just can't go out on the, even the skills lot anymore until they have the permit. Has anyone created like a, a, a check sheet for all of this that they're tracking everyone on so they know where they're at that they can share with everyone or has no one created something like that yet? 
So, so we did, we, we start, okay, so like this is kind of more tedious than we thought, but we just have one person completed. So happy to share what we've started, but now knowing that, I think we might just adjust it a tiny bit. It kind of like a, an all in one sheet, you know, here's what theory, this is what we've all covered, check mark, this is a date completed, a CDL one, a behind the wheel arrange, uh, just so you like every, you know, everything's on track. I haven't created one yet. I, and I don't like creating something. If someone already has something, I like to borrow. I yeah. don't steal, I borrow. I think Stephanie, Stephanie definitely put together a really good package and that's what we're capitalizing on. Mm -hmm. um, we're felt it, we're going through it. We're, we're just using it. And then when we see redundancy, we're like, that's okay to be redundant on that topic. And then if there's too much redundancy, then we're gonna kind of consolidate a little bit. But um, I really like what Stephanie put together. And then we also created our files based on Stephanie's recommendation. And we're not quite through that process 100%, but that gave us a really good checklist. And then in our uh, Traversa database, um, we're able to track that as well, kind of like an online checklist. No, don't give Stephanie too many compliments. She won't be able to get out of that office. Go <laughs> away. <laughs> And if anybody does create a list like that, a check a checklist, if you'd be willing to share it, uh, we can put it on the trust website and we can ask Mr. Jason there to put it on the TAA website and it's just one more resource. People are people feel overwhelmed with the ELDT stuff, so if you're creating a resource, please please let us share it. People people are wanting things. For sure. Any other questions or comments about uh, map 21? Nobody. Okay, Stephanie, you wanna talk about the, what the webinar is gonna be about on Tuesday? Oh, it's just a, like what we're talking about here, glitches and successes. Um, I have talked to more third-party testers and MVD offices in the, since February 7th than I have in my entire career. And it's because our school districts are educated about ELDT and MAP21. We've all been talking about this for two and a half, almost three years. The MVD offices literally got a one page. This is what it is. This is what you do. These are the requirements. If you want more information, go read the regulations. So school districts are having challenges at the MVD level because MVD doesn't know uh, what, the, what they're supposed to be doing, when they're supposed to be requiring data in the, um, on the web. So the, the webinar on Tuesday is simply scenarios and frequently asked questions that, I'm, that we're fielding at the trust and how to solve those problems and what the outcomes are. Well, and, and an issue we're, we're running into here is that when you ask DMV anything, it's like, that's not our problem. That's a federal thing. We have nothing to do with it. So, I mean, well, they're not and even... that's just a lack of education. It's yeah, the hand a lack of education. The, you know, I've said this a thousand times. The trust shouldn't have been the one to put out ELDT stuff. It should have been ADOT. It should have been, it should have been the people who are actually uh, looking at the website at ADOT. But it is what it is. But good on the school districts in the state for getting their ducks in a row. So that's good. Sure. All right. Well, I, I wasn't planning for this to be a Stephanie show and the, the second half won't be, but Stephanie, uh, <laughs> moving on, moving on, would you like to talk about the SB 1630? Uh, probably an introduction, because I don't know, are there many people here that know what SB 1630 is? Just show of hands or head nods. I do. Shannon. Some people, yes. Some people don't. So maybe a high level intro of what it is and then uh, kind of where it's at in the process. Okie doke. Um, 1630 was uh, written, funded by charter schools. Uh, that's important context. Uh, the bill is essentially uh, proposing that the state allows 11 to 15 passenger vans for daily student transport use. Uh, and if you guys remember historically, 11 to 15 passenger vans are the ones that are that have a history of rollover, killing students, blowing up. So it's not a it's not a good bill. And the the um, verbiage that's being thrown around legislation is it's going to solve the bus driver shortage. And the the trust, I'll tell you, the trust has come out 
as opposed to the bill because historically the trust saw the claims and paid the claims on deaths. And so there, you know, there's a huge understanding of what it means to allow these vehicles to be back out on the road legally for student transportation. Uh, there's just been an amendment on it to add uh, to add type A, B, C, D, including utility, they're calling them utility buses, but they're the uh, white activity buses. They're now including those as allowable for student transportation use without a CDL. Oh and this goodness. is not, yes, this is not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the amendment makes this bill, uh, what did the trust attorney call it? Uh, a crap sandwich with really, really good bread mm -hmm. because we like the amendment because here's what it does. Uh, the white, the activity buses and the type A, B, C, and D, those are just shapes. Those are, those are shapes of buses. Uh, it's legal to drive those without a CDL up to the 15 passenger size. Other states allow non-CDL drivers to drive the school buses, the yellow ones, uh, without a CDL because it's legal to do so at the federal level. Uh, part of the bill says that DPS has to create guidelines for who's gonna drive these vehicles, how they drive them. And they might not need a CDL, but the verbiage is there that anybody who's gonna drive one of those vehicles, the type A, B, C, or D, or the multi-function school activity buses, uh, they don't have to have the CDL, but they do have to have the school bus certificate issued by DPS. So DPS has to come in, redo a little bit of the verbiage and say these people are allowed to drive these vehicles uh, and meet all of the school bus uh, certificate guidelines with the exception of having a CDL. Oh my goodness. So, so while it's not perfect, it at least allows everybody to say, okay, we really need you not to use these vans because they kill students, but here's a recourse for you. You can use these vehicles over here and recruit non-CDL drivers uh, who want to drive students, but they don't want to be put in a big, huge bus. So that's what SB 30 is. It's probably going to pass next week. And it's something we're going to have to revamp, you know, what white plate looks like because it's going to alter the look of daily student transportation. It's my hope that DPS does right by us in the industry. That is my hope. Any questions? Yeah. Ryan? Yep. So, Stephanie, the way I understand it now is that like the, the 15 passenger minibus MFSABs are, can be driven by somebody without a CDL um, as long as it's school to school. The minute you do home to school or curb to school, it becomes a school bus which requires the um, DPS certificate, which at this point in time requires a CDL. What you're saying is that part of this bill would be that there would be a separate certificate a DPS school bus certificate that you could have without a CDL? Yes, and I want to respond to something that you put in earlier there. Uh, I just had a school district call and say that the Auditor General is now um, hitting school districts for using uh, the white buses, like you were saying, or even um, the legal vans, the 11 to 15 passenger vans that they shouldn't even have. Uh, they're dinging them for, for unauthorized use. So even on the shuttles, like you mentioned, um, the Auditor General is now saying, nope, that's not acceptable. So Jason and I are trying to go, we're trying to give guidelines on what you can legally do, but um, since they're not regulated by DPS, we have to go by what the Auditor General says, and they are now saying you can't use the white buses for any student transportation except for uh, school-sponsored events like field trips, uh, yeah. activity, that sort of thing. Right now, those folks don't need a, a CDL. They're, they're going to continue not to need one. But if you want to use them for student transportation, uh, they have to meet the school bus cert guidelines that the bus drivers today do. So they're kind yeah. of putting that, that stipulation on somebody driving them. So that would be passenger vans too. 
Six Darla, years. Darla, Six. ask the question again. Are, are you talking, I, I understand the, the white fleet for the activities. Are, are you talking about the uh, four or five seater, six seater passenger vans too? No, those are completely legal. Up to 10 passenger with a driver, those we're not even talking about because those are legal to use. Uh, the, the state of Arizona doesn't care if you go out and buy a Dodge Caravan and use that for student transport. This is anything from 11 to 15 passengers with a driver. Tommy. So. Oh, sorry. So if um, if this goes forward, so you said you hope DPS will jump on board and do their part. So it goes whether they modify their, um, I'll say, minimum standards to reflect this or not. So that's a really great question. I'm glad you asked that, Shannon. Um, this does not mean that school districts, if it passes next week, uh, can suddenly start to use them. The answer is no. There's a provision in the in the uh, bill that says um, you can't school districts or entities cannot start doing this until DPS uh, creates the regulations. Oh good. So uh, Tommy, I think you answered it when you answered Darla's. Okay. So that's 1630 so so look look for that. Thank you. Any questions or call, just general comments for the group about maybe what, how people are feeling or thoughts about that? No. <laughs> I've already I had, <laughs> Kissel? I had some conversation just oh. with Shannon that, you know, I think my concern is that no different than school districts uh, that don't or charters or privates that tend to purchase our buses after we feel that they've served their life, you know, with us um, and tend not to have a, a great maintenance program in, in many cases. Um, I know that that can't be a blanket statement, but I, you know, I shared with um, uh, several people up at ASBO, you know, I mean, the, the concern is just that, I mean, the more we open this up, um, are we exposing our kids to any greater danger, you know, with a, a non-licensed or non-certified driver, a non-DPS certified driver, uh, you know, a, a less than professional driver? Um, are we putting our kids in any danger by opening up what vehicles we use? Certainly we all, I think we've all agreed the 15 pa passenger um, vans you know, um, I know she included blow up. I, I don't remember the blow up, but I know that they they roll and throw everybody out the windows and stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. but you know what I'm saying? It's like I, I, there is some concern there and from the industry. I'm not threatened that somebody will not have a need for me or our drivers are threatened. Um, I think that's a long way away because there's nobody in line for any job right now, um, let alone a professional driver. But um, I think that all of us should be um, making people around us aware of our concern that um, there has to be some real thought behind what vehicles we open up um, and how much we lax, you know, how lax do we get on our rules and regulations around the vehicles that are transporting children. And um, yeah, I just, I, I just want to emphasize that um, this is our industry that we're all very proud of. And when things like this come up, you know, we, we need to make sure that people are aware and people are, are you know, um, thinking about why, why it's not the greatest idea, you know, I mean, and then I think that's what we get together for is kind of the, not necessarily all agree, but to align some thinking around topics. And this is one that I think puts kids in danger um, or it has a greater exposure. And, um, you know, we need to be concerned about it. And I think, I am I mean, I'm concerned about just the fact that, right, we just transitioned. So what about our drug screens and our PPTs and all the things that we do to ensure we can evacuate safely and swiftly? Is that going to apply to the folks who drive these white vehicles that are not federally? Yes. Used? So, so think about what we have to do, the requirements for somebody that we train today to become a school bus driver on the DPS side. 
Sure. That that's going to be there for anybody who drives these vehicles. Okay. What they what they've taken away is the CDL portion, and and I will tell you that Jason and I have talked. Every single representative that voted on this bill who actually had a conversation with me so that I was allowed to educate them about, about this, they voted no. It was just a matter of how many people could we, could we talk to about this and educate. And Jason was in talks with a, a representative back and forth on here's a laundry list of why this is bad. And that representative voted no. So if there was the opportunity to educate these folks, they voted no. But the fact yeah. is, if it's presented as helping the school bus industry get drivers, if we're not in their face saying this, this is not good, they, they're going to hear that and think, oh, yeah, it'll help the industry. So, so Stephanie and Jason and, you know, Eric, especially, do you think this is something that uh, the state organizations, ASBO Transportation, AAPT, TAA can get together and write you know, if they're against this and why, and just mail it to everyone that's going to vote for that. Each one mail a letter, they get three letters for it. I mean, is that, is it so, a chance that's to a, take for the lobbying? I mean, yeah. so that's a really good question, but here's the thing. Um, the entities that you mentioned, including the trust, um, all of those entities that you're talking about, uh, they would be seen as hating, hating charter schools or hating, hating on someone trying to uh, bring in some additional resources and nobody wants to be in that position. Uh, we are not the only entity to come out and say no against this and we have been fighting it behind the scenes. Our, our lobbyists are talking to DPS lobbyists. We, I met with DPS, I met with the bill writers. We've, we've done all this. The, the entities that could and should be involved are doing it behind the scenes. It, it's just not, uh, we're not out there talking to the legislature, the legislators in a recorded session because that, that doesn't do anybody any good. It makes those people then look like they're against trying to help student transportation. Well, well, and we know we're not, you know, I know that I get that. We, we need resources. You're absolutely correct. But I think- not if, at if, the expense of safety. I just think if, if directors wrote letters to some of their legislatures and, and the legislators that represent their district, you know what I mean? And I mean, there should be a way for you to find that information out. I had a whole list in my old office, write them and say, look, I'm all for helping us out and I need people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is a huge this hit is on not the, the answer side right. of it. This is not the right. right answer. I would love to brainstorm with you on what we need, but safety, compromising safety for this just to help kids get to school is not the answer at all whatsoever. So I, I was able to write to my um, representative and did so. I have not, I did not receive a response one way or the other. Well, and I'll just to end this, so we do because we all know it's this is not a this is not a good thing. Um, the last we I've got two last things that we're doing. Um, there, I have a letter to the governor asking him to veto the bill and spelling out the reasons why. It doesn't matter what the state does at the federal level; these vehicles will still the vans will still be against the law. That that's not changing, and you're putting our districts in a our school districts in the state in a bad position. And then secondly, when it does pass, which it probably will, you can bet your sweet bippy, I will be right up in Will Lunt's face and the new, the new uh, STU supervisor saying, look, at the federal level, because they're not federal regulation experts. That's where I have to educate them and say, you can do all this and you can put this in place, but at the federal level, it's still against the law. And these are the ramifications of our school our school districts doing this. So there's two more things, the letter and me having that talk with them. So. I, you know, I, there's so much behind this, right? And I think the, the couple things it's going to definitely confuse people more so with the vehicles that are beginning 
coming out and depending on how the rules and regulations get written by DPS for that, right? If it's gonna, if it's, if we're saying that now 10 passengers or nine passengers or less don't require any type of school bus certification or anything that can hire anybody and basically put them out on the road, right? Then you have 11 to 15 passenger vehicles. If you wanna use those, you have to go through, let's just, let's just hypothetically say 14 hours of classroom and 20 hours behind the wheel in similar school bus driver training, right? So they get a school bus certificate to drive those vehicles. I think there's gonna be a bigger impact of bus drivers that are gonna say, I don't really wanna drive a bus. I still have my school bus certificate. So I'm gonna let my CDL go. And now I'm gonna drive these white vehicles, uh, right? Vehicle. Or these, mm-hmm. or, right. or a smaller passenger vehicle. And it's just gonna create even more of a headache for people. It's, it's just big time unintended consequences that they're not paying attention to. And to Stephanie's point, like we did, TA did send an email to several legislators on the Arizona Education uh, or in the House Education Committee um, tell you trying to say it because we didn't have an opportunity, TA That's didn't have good. an opportunity to make it down to go speak um, to the Education Committee about the bill uh, just because it was kind of a last minute thing. So we did send a, a letter and effort to try and educate and, and put our position statement as far as TA goes um in you know in this but again there was there was good conversation on the floor but when you have people who are um you know people who are sitting there communicating about uh from private schools and charter schools and the the you know the bill the bill rider they're basically telling their narrative exactly how they want it to go and making it i mean none of these people really are connected to, to public education except for you know the I think Excel was represented there, the, the special education school, but um, you know, they're, they're saying, they're showing it that this was a good thing. So, um, you know, definitely a little bit disheartening, but I think to Eric's point, I'll echo on that, right? If it's our decision, regardless of how this comes out to where we can, you know, basically say we as a district are not going to use these types of vehicles and make that decision, then we are protecting our group of kids, right? And so I think those are the things that, you know, obviously with the help from the trust, whatever DPS decides to do, hopefully we can, you know, really kind of bolster and strengthen the rules and regulations around these types of vehicles. Then depending on that, the district can then make that decision. Hey, this is good for us. Or, hey, you know what? We're, you know, I came from a district that was my first district they were zero white fleet vehicles. Everything was done on a school bus with a CDL driver. So they had those rules um, in place as a procedure in their district. And, you know, maybe more of those districts take that type of, you know, kind of mindset in, in what that looks like. I think you're right that you're going to have the drivers um, that don't want that responsibility and just give up the CDL. They don't have to worry about the two-year physical. Um, I'll just drive this little one. Um, the other issue that that I would push, and I don't know if Stephanie, if the trust would be one to recommend this also, I would still want those drivers in a separate pool for uh, drug screens. Now in the non-DOT pool, but they're still subject as a district procedure. I don't know if you want to say policy, because that's a whole issue at the district level, but um, they will be subject to randoms, post-accident, annuals, um, just CYA. All Um, the things, yeah. I, I, and, and DPS may put that in there with this special certification, special cert that they get, but it would be something that I would be pushing because I'm not going to let just anyone out there to drive a bus. Yeah. Well, that's true. And then my biggest thing I told Stephanie was like, you know, I'm kind of torn, right? Because I mean, I have this really great need and we're, we're struggling. And so like a 15 passenger activity van that meets all the specs of a school bus you know, it's twice its weight crush proof and has a side impact ratings. So basically it's a type A that's been decertified, right? The only thing we're missing is when we make the stop, we don't have a stop arm in eight ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking to myself, like to run my out of districts, that might be a huge help. There's going to be a pay differential. I'm not going to pay you the same as a CDL license driver. So that would discourage some of my drivers to roll back to that position. Um, but that would be a huge help if I could run my activity vans door to door or, you know, school to home uh, and vice versa. And, and so selfishly, I, I my first thought is 
well, it just opens three more opportunities, three more people that might be able to help maybe get those um, outsourced schools that takes a bus away from three tiers, yep. you know, just to serve six kids or whatever. So logistically, it really, really, you know, I started salivating. I'm like, this could help. Um, but, you know, I just, but then when Steph and I were talking, she's like, Eric, this is 15 passenger vans, vans. And I'm like, we threw those out years ago. You know, like somebody said in the chat and I, I was like, we can't, you know, and then I just th started thinking about the abuses by those who are willing to abuse. All right. And that, there that, you is go. Probably, there you go. that is probably none of you on this call, but those who are willing to abuse and are in it to make a dollar, it's a cheap vehicle, cheaper driver. And, and you know, I don't, and of course, we're going to do what we can to protect our kids and that our names on them, but in our industry in, in general, um, if we can have an influence that somebody has a tougher time um, doing this less than what we think it should be done, then yes, I would like to see our um, ASBO and um, TAA, AAPT, you know, lobbying to make sure that we're at least given that opinion that we would like to see and make sure that it's done at a manner we all could be proud of. Sure. So, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm in that boat, man, if I could roll my three, I only have three, we're not that big, but my three activity vans, I mean, they, they're the school bus spec. You got to be a little careful, stop on the proper side of the curb because you don't have a crossing arm, all that. I mean, I think I could do it pretty safely, but, but on the other hand, I'm just thinking that's ah, one more layer that I create, you just yeah. get taken advantage of by some that, that do, and it wouldn't be in our best interest. Sure. Yeah. All uh, right. I, Go ahead, Shannon. No, Go. it's okay. It's just on and on. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll bring this we'll bring this topic back up in uh, hopefully we'll meet in May right before uh, the conference. So I know I'm sure this this will also make its way into the TA conference. Um, but let's transition over to field trips. There's a question that came in just about. Um, kind of how you assign field trips, what your process looks like. Do you bid them out? Do you do them on a rotational basis? Um, and also, I think with the driver shortage, what uh, is your current procedure for when, you know, everybody gets them the trips that come in and say, hey, we want to be picked up at uh, 8 a.m. and we want to get dropped back off at, right before the bell rings at three. But you've got, you know, buses out on routes during that time, what are you, what are you, are you denying those trips? Are you telling them they need to bid them out or to, uh, you know, like a private, private bus company? Anybody want to share what their field trip process and procedures are? Patrick. So our, our process is probably uh, not a very formal process, but essentially at the beginning of the year, anybody who wants to drive those extra runs will sign up for them. Um, typically the dispatcher will look and see who's closest to a particular school at a particular time. Uh, if somebody wants to do that midday type thing, uh, weekends, we kind of rotate, uh, unless everybody's, uh, full up, then we, then everybody gets them, uh, arrival and leave time from the school. If it's during our route times, we tell them this is the closest we can get to you. We will try to get there but we um you know if they want to pick up at 7 30 uh we tell them the closest we can get is probably 7 45 depending on the driver and where the school is located otherwise um we have had them change pick up and drop off times in order to accommodate if it's in town out of town trips right now everything's chartered anyway so it doesn't matter but we have reached the uh a budgetary point where um, up until say January, February, they were paying what our posted prices were for out of town trips. Currently they are paying <clears throat> the charter, <clears throat> excuse me, the charter price for those out of town trips and they're paying the full uh, weight of it. And um, depending on the trip, they're being asked to pay for those from not non MNO funds. So tax credit money, things like that. Um, just because 
we've had a little bit of a budget crunch uh, <clears throat> here towards the end of the school year. And that's this is the first time that's ever happened to us that I'm aware of. Interesting. I put it in the chat, but our um, high school AIA events have dedicated trip drivers and those drivers don't have routes because inevitably they're leaving before dismissal and can rarely cover in the morning because of the hours rule. So I've, you know, I have three high schools and however many sports that is, and we travel, you know, pretty far, Safford, Thatcher, those are our opponents. So I have people who just do those high school AIA trips and then my grade level um, K-8 trips have to be between um, 9 and 1.30 as to not impact dismissal and no trips on Wednesdays because we have early release. Hey, hey Shannon. Uh-huh. You have enough drivers that you can have just dedicated field trip drivers and still cover all your routes? Well, it's just designed that way. So there's three positions in my position pool that are specifically um, – AIA trip drivers, it's a little bit of a different rate of pay because they're doing mountains, nights, and weekends. And so then when they don't have trips, they help me cover routes, but there are um, three additional FTEs that are not for routes. So in a perfect world, I, I need more, but like, it's kind of like that whole borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Like if you have a midday, you can't do a field trip because then I have to cover your midday. So for them, it's like if they're not driving a trip, I can um, have them help with routes or absences, but at least I don't have to charter or send an inexperienced mountain driver on a trip. So it's kind of the lesser of the two evils. Yeah. So Trace, I, I wanna kind of add to that a little bit. Um, I was very, at the beginning and even before the beginning of my tenure here, um, you know, we, we were very adamant that students uh, going to school was our primary mission and, and that's what we we're going to support, period. Um, and I found I lost drivers. So I, I'm okay hiring a driver that wants to drive two, three days a week and just drive trips because one driver driving trips might save the district. 75 to a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And I can cover the trip. I can reduce our overall cost for the district. Um, and I, I basically just had to change my perspective, my point of view on what the value of that individual is. Um, so that's, that's been a lesson for me. One of the things that it does too, is, you know, they kind of build their relationship with their coaches and then all of a sudden they're like adapting and adjusting and um, like if you have high school you know you get the calls late at night or all of the unexpected like what do I do this happened but as these folks do these season after season they kind of you just kind of right earn you you they just get really good at it and navigating through and and those like aha moments and panic situations um definitely have been reduced over time because these three folks have been here for several years now. Yeah, I, I get the whole dedicated driver would be wonderful. I just, almost all of my drivers are getting 55 hours a week, you know, and so we're kind of going, well, no, you can't do a field trip and you can. And then we have the whole seniority fight is why did he get the nice run and I didn't. And, and that's you know, why they're well, separate. So, you know. so, they, I mean, the field trips to the zoo and the field trips to the science center are different, but for these high school athletic events, it's just a different pool of folks. It, it works for us. We could talk about it more if you'd like, but um, it, it's, it's helpful because it's mountains and it's dark and it's snow and it's, you know, some things that just don't normally happen for our, our regular um, staff. Chase, we did a, a daytime trip list and then not an evening and weekend trip list that drivers could sign up for. And then the field trip software that we had, we put it in by seniority and it just did a rotation. And the drivers didn't get to pick what they got. It's this was assigned to you. This is what you okay. get. You decide not to do it. Okay, that's your pass. You get three passes before you're removed from that trip list for the next week. And um, if a driver was on, they could be on as many lists as they want. Uh, but if they did a daytime trip, if we could, we avoided putting them on a nighttime trip because of that overtime piece and their uh, hours of service. 
Um, but again, I was there, I was only in elementary. I had so many few weekend and night trips that I had no problems with people jumping on them. Um, but we just had different rotation lists for them to be on. And then the routing software we used, we put it in with their seniority dates and it just did the rotation for us. Wherever it ended the next week, it just started with that next person. And then once a quarter, I always did a report to show how many trips everyone has been assigned to them, how many they've taken and how many they've uh, passed on. Um, so it was just up so everyone could just see that it, it stayed even across the board. Yeah, I think Trace is using similar. I mean, inverse trends, it'll show you, you know, who's who's busy in the schedule, right? And the thing right. that we always ran into was people wanted to do field trips, but they had a, a midday assigned. And so when mm -hmm. they got their assignment for a field trip, then we're having, we're short because we're having to cover their field trips. And so yeah. I, I wanted to change that process. I was un, unsuccessful before I left, but basically saying, if you, if you bid for a route and you have a midday, then you you're, field you're not going to do field trips. Right. You, know, you, might, you might get Peter. to sign up for the evening. You know, we had just within district, uh, athletic shuttles so we you know we didn't have as what you guys have but yeah. i think you have to structurally kind of make some decisions this will probably piss some people off if, but if you had a midday gonna... route if you had a midday route you were not eligible for the daytime field trip list you were exactly. eligible for the evening yeah. and weekend trip list because your route comes first no matter what yeah and if it's that's borrowing from one to pay the other that's exactly how we do it too yeah so I think those are just the, you know, the, the pieces about it. And, and I get it. There were, I, I saw over time less and less people wanting to do field trips. I don't know if that's just because, you know, they're just more and more stressed out or whatever, but we used to, even for summer, right. We had, we had probably 25, 30 people that, you know, would want to work through the summer and do summer school and summer field trips. And I feel like in our last final year, we were down to like a dozen that, you know, were really wanting to do work. So we were actually turning work away because so we can't do this. So, um, and, but yeah, definitely interesting. Pat, uh, Trace, for the local stuff, we did as many drop in returns as we could. And would just discuss with the schools, hey, like Patrick said, this is the earliest we can get you there. We would take them, come back, do a route, and then go back and get them after routes were finished just to get them there. But I did as many drop and returns as possible. And then um, our mechanics um, were not school bus certified. They didn't have a DPS cert. That was a rule that was in place for years. But they would do like my ball game shuttles if I had to, because it was no longer home to school, school to home. They had the P and the S, so they would take a team over during playoffs, and then one of my drivers would go after route and sit and wait to bring them back. So just just a drop or turn. And I don't know how many of those shuttles I did myself because I wasn't driving, but it was I was available, so I would go do it. I don't know how many trips over to Gilbert I took to go to stinking Jake's whatever amazing Jake's, Jake's. 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 at the end of the year <laughs> because they all had to leave and come back at this time. So yeah. Um, it, it, it's a puzzle. It is all just a puzzle. And then you get into the piece where some districts, this is your route pay, but this is your field trip pay. And they don't want to do it because field trip pay is less than what route pay is. Um, so hmm. yeah, we didn't have that problem. The route, not even the hour, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Well, Anybody field trip coordinator starting Monday and just if I'm going to make changes, now's the time to change it. So sure. that's why I'm looking for ideas. And, you know, if somebody's already skinned the cat, I don't need to do it again. For sure. That's it. Many hands make light work, my friend. Anybody else want to share their field trip process procedures or assignments? When I started, we had like 10 people who were trip drivers slash um, sub drivers. I, I, I'm not so lucky as to have that many extra people at the moment, but um, we also did basically uh, we'd, we'd meet once a week and do, we'd pick our trips for like the next two weeks out. Uh, and those drivers picked essentially the AIA out of town trips, the shuttles we, we left to route drivers. But um, when you have enough people that works pretty well, if you don't have enough people, you got to figure something else out. But like I said, the, the way we're doing it right now, some some of them will have like a track and field trip that goes to Williams or Winslow or something, and we'll have a driver take them after morning route. They come back here, they drive their afternoon route, somebody else picks them up in the evening. So 
even as far out as someplace like that, we'll do a do drop and then go back and pick up later, just like Tommy is talking about. Yeah, it's probably easier said than done, but I think to Pat Patrick kind of said it like we're in the business of transporting students, right? And so I think if you're sharing that message with your staff, right, it's you don't even like our sports before I left Kyrene was you didn't get an option. We needed all hands on deck to do sports. We needed all hands on deck to do the big eighth grade trip that went to Big Surf, you know, at the end of the year. We needed all hands on, like, no, but you didn't get a choice. It was, these were the things that we would tap you for. And I would say, Trace, that if you're, you know, if you have somebody who can pick up a trip or, or run, you know, run a, a sports team out, and then you have night drivers that go out and grab them and bring them back type of thing. It's just, you know, like Tommy said, it's a, it's a total puzzle just trying to figure out how to, and it takes, it will take your field trip coordinator to like spatially look at something and artistically it's a puzzle, right? It's not, there's not a one size fits all every week. It's Hey, I think I can do this and having the right people that are going to say, you know what, I'm willing to do it because we're here and this is what we do. So um, one of the things that uh, happens here um Trace, you have a trip going to Mesa to Dobson from Gilbert, you know, and but they want to be there. Your driver would have to go before, you know, during route time, but Mesa doesn't get out yet. You know, I would call Mesa and go, what would you, what would you charge me if I had you pick my team up and bring them over and then they could go into their route, you know, kind of using those around you as well. We do that with the district just south of us where I'm at right now. We're going to pick up their teams because they're playing here in our district. We'll go pick them up, bring them, drop them off. Then we do our routes. And then, you know, they'll come get them and take them back after the round. So um, it's, it, it's literally a puzzle and jumping outside the big yellow box. Yep. So um, you me, Sorry, is, can you say that again one more time? I missed part of it because you cut out. But I, um, I think what you're telling me, Tommy, is that David's going to do my field trips, right? <laughs> For Scott still, yes. The right, bring over, right. You'll go get them at the end. Uh, Darla, what I said was we would talk with districts around us. Like, you know, Trace has a game in Mesa's district. And, but his buses can't do it because it's during route time, but Mesa's not yet. Call Mesa and say, hey, how much would you charge me to do a one-way trip where you pick our team up, bring over there, then you do your routes and then I can, then I'll bring them back afterwards. Yeah. You know, and again, it's not, we don't not like each other. It's we're all in this for the same business. What can we do to help each other out? For sure. You know, tell your coach, yes, you're going to get on a Mesa bus, deal with it if you want to play. You don't want to ride a Mesa <laughs> bus. You know, you're cross country, start running over there and I'll meet you after the meet. I, don't care. I, I think sometimes for, for me too, just a last thought, like the AIA, like they want to leave significantly early because they want to like add a stop at, I don't know, the Chick-fil-A or the park or the whatever museum. And it's like, look, <laughs> we would have been good, but we can't, right? <laughs> so, so really just being like, is that really necessary? And sometimes that is the difference between like we can't if we can we will but if we can't like it looks like you have four hours before game time talk to me about that because i don't have the resources to have a driver number one it's four more hours on their driving day and number two i that's the difference from them covering their route or not yeah so um when you talk about shortening up trips shannon um we because of I mentioned our budgetary issues a little bit ago um, if we have those longer trips I'll put a driver up in a hotel but because of our staff shortages um, and I've been the one to make all the reservations the hotel reservations we push those back onto the 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 coaches uh, and the money comes out of um, basically their booster funds mm-hmm well, guess what? Those trips are all of a sudden a lot shorter. shorter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure we could get you a pretty good deal uh, using those two coaches right there. Where There they are. You know, pretty Northern Express on the side of those to come out. It's only, what, 20 hours to drive here? It is 27 hours one oh, way. I'm okay, listening. there you go. Sounds very affordable. All right, we'll table uh, number five uh, for our next meeting. So we'll just take five minutes for any open comments uh, that anybody wants to either comment for the good of the order, and then we'll close up the meeting. I think um, I'm considering sending out an email, kind of doing a, a, an informal 
survey of the big ticket items that you guys have had to replace on your vehicles. There's been kind of a, I have new people in the shop and they're questioning the numbers of transmissions and turbos that we are replacing. So mm. just curious uh, where everybody else has fallen kind of percentage wise, mileage wise, but I think I'll do that in email. Okay. Anybody else? The good of the order? Yeah, I had a question. Wrong. Is, yep. is anybody doing any kind of like turn by turn navigation devices in their buses? Trace Tolby, one. Eric Kissel, Patrick Fleming. I think okay. Josh Crosby at Higley was doing them also. Yes, yep. Josh. Uh, was Madison picking them up? I thought Madison was. Um, Cartwright Elementary is going to start next year with it, I believe, also. So you do have some resources there. Okay. Any yeah, I don't know if Madison did turn by turn. I, uh, I'm trying to think what they did. It might be. You might be right. I, I It was like a field trip thing or a tablet-based GPS or something. Yeah, because it, they were intriguing, but not a real in-depth company, but really cute. I give it cool. Cute's a neat word. It's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday, and I came straight from an HR meeting to here. So that tells you how my Friday's been. Yeah, so we're, we're just to kind of give a we're doing we're using synovia for our routes but um you can also put in navigation for your trip so you have your location and uh i didn't know that till i took a trip and i put it in there and it was uh it was actually fairly accurate nice technology is coming a long long ways yeah it's too bad those running your division can't catch up to it quick enough <laughs> sorry did i say that out loud my bad and the navigation was a game changer to me because I don't know the East Valley that well, you know, being a West Side guy. And then all of a sudden I got to run a route and I don't know where these streets are and all this kind of crap. And man, make it up nice. as you go. Yeah, it's it's nice just to plug in the trip and follow the arrow. All right. Well, any other comments? We'll two minutes and we'll wrap it up. Nope. Anybody got an end of the year day count going? I have a question. Oh, yep. Go ahead. Are Ken. there any of you that are using Transversa? And if so, what are your thoughts? I think Darla Traversa, Tommy. the web based, the web based version. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you went to it from VersaTrans, you're not going to like it at first. I will flat out say that if you use VersaTrans for years and you slip to Traversa, you're not going to like it at first. Um, but it does grow on you. There are things that it can do that VersaTrans doesn't that are absolutely amazing. There are things like that Versa changing Trans Changing stop times. Yo, that is absolutely, <laughs> that is friggin' awesome, I'm telling you. Uh, there are things that VersaTrans did that Traversa can't. The reporting <clears throat> is better in VersaTrans than Traversa. Um, Traversa is more of a piece by piece. If you want to do everything VersaTrans did, you have to buy every piece of it. They're kind of piecemealing stuff together. Um, mapping, what's nice is they're using the Esri map. So when your county updates the map, it's already updated in your program. You don't have to build it in, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you're waiting on the county to do it. I, I, okay. I, I, I won't lie about that. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind it. I've just started using it this year. Over the last couple months, I'm learning my way around. It's you're used to one way, but it's a different verbiage in this one, but it does the same thing that you want it to do. And you're just learning that. It's not a bad program. And the best piece is you can do it from home in your pajamas because it's web-based. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we have uh, Synovia, but we have nothing else. We do everything on Google Sheets. We are old school here in Prescott. So I am looking at implementing something and doing away with school dude and something that's going to be universal in one system. That's I'm, why I was asking, because I'm working with a district right now that's converting over to it. Um, with VersaTrans RNP, you everything is there. With Traversa, it's pieced out. Um, you don't get trips. You have to get advanced trips. You want advanced this, you want this. Um, if you're going to do multiple districts or multiple counties, it's it's a, it's a, a bigger ordeal to get. But um, I, 
I, I'm okay with it. I, I'm not upset with it. I don't hate it. I didn't like mm -hmm. it at first because I'm used to my RP, but um, I don't mind it. Okay. It grows on you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Uh, do we want to do one more of these before um, TAA? I know probably looking right around Memorial Day before, uh, probably after the school year. You want to do it after Memorial Day? That would be May or June 3rd, either May 27th before Memorial Day or June 3rd. Any comments about that? May 27th is our graduation. So if we're not a, not a good day, if it's, if I have anything to say about it, I would say not that day. Yeah. Or we could, or we could do the, what's the one before that? Uh, May 20th. May 20th. June third is the last day of school. It's half we day. we typically that. shoot for the third third Friday. So if you want to do the twentieth, if the twentieth works for everybody, we can set it up that way. May twentieth is better for I. Okay. I mean, I I think we start our four day work weeks, and I will hopefully log in from home. I say the Bermuda Triangle. A no, that's, that's the next <laughs> week. No, man, it ain't even a cruise. Forty five foot boat, baby. There you go. BVI. Nice. All right. Well, I'll send them out for the 20th and we'll see you guys in May. Hopefully you have a good next three, four weeks and um, take care. Good seeing all your faces. Miss each one of you. Adios. Miss you too. Bye. Bye.